Okay, today's daf we're going to be learning is Ketubot Ayin Zayin. Um, I'll just mention it's Rosh Hashanah next week, and it's two days. So I'm going to be posting the dapim. Hopefully later today I'll put them up. Um, so you can search them by daf um, if you want to find them. Or if you get our links, we'll send them out. If you're on one of our WhatsApp groups, we're going to send them out to the WhatsApp groups where you can find the, the dapim for Rosh Hashanah. So if you want to get ahead, I know it's sometimes a little annoying to learn them out of order, but if you want to get ahead, um, you can do the Rosh Hashanah Dapim, so I will put them up hopefully later today. Okay. Um, okay. Today's staff is sponsored by Sherry and Shelley and Jerry Gornish in loving memory of their Ayin Zion, to vote Ayin Zion, their beloved grandson, Oz Wolchik. Okay, we're going to start and finish up our suga from yesterday. If you recall, we were in the middle of discussing this case that Shmuel was quoted first by Rabbi Yehuda and then by Rami Bar Yechezkel, his brother, as saying one thing and then saying something else about a case where we trade, we barter the para for the chamol. You take the para before, right? We don't know actually, but at some point the chamor is dead. The question is, did the chamor die before or did the chamor die after? Who's supposed to bring the proof? So we say about, right, according to Rav Yehuda, he said it's the Bala Chamor has to prove that the I'm sorry the right the Bala Chamor has to prove that his Chamor was still alive at the time. Otherwise, he has to return the para to the original owner. How do we explain that? Because we said there's a weakness in the Kenyan, even though normally I'm and really the Bala para is trying to take the, his animal back, his cow back from the other person. Theoretically, the burden of proof should rely on him. Well, according to Rav Yehuda, in the name of Shmuel, no. Because there's a weakened, again, this is one of the explanations given, there's a weakened Kenyan here. The Kenyan might be messed up. There might not have ever been a Kenyan. So he doesn't really have a right, even though it's in his property right now. And therefore, the burden of proof relies on him to keep the para in his hands. Then we brought this contradiction from the case of this tabach and the butcher and the guy selling the meat to the butcher. And we basically said, oh, it doesn't really work because... It would have to be in a particular case only it would make sense, it would be the same, and therefore they reject it. Therefore comes Rabbi Rechezka and he says, don't listen to anything my brother says in the name of Shmuel, really what Shmuel said, starting from seven lines at the bottom, from yesterday's daf, or eight lines. Kol safek alav haraya. The one whose possession it was in at the time. So in the case of our case, it's the Baal Hapara has the chamor in his possession. And whether it's even in his possession, it almost doesn't matter because they bartered it. So that already puts it on his side. And in the case of the trefa, who is it? It's the butcher. The butcher has it in his possession when he shechs it. And he has to prove, because it's in his possession, he has to prove that that it's um, in order to get his money back from the other guy. So we didn't read this yet inside, so let's get back to it. But before, I won't really want to talk about Tana Tuna Kala. It's the exact same thing with the Kala. Because again, who has to prove it? If she's in a father's house, the burden of proof is on the father. If she's on the husband, the burden of proof is on the husband. That perfectly fits in well with what he said. So Meitive, now we go back to this bright about the tray from Machachin and say Bovi Beta Now the question is like this. Who has to prove it? So if he already paid the money... Right? Then, what did he say here? It said, So who's the motzi mechavero? So if I'm the butcher and I already paid the money, and it turns out it was a trefa, I want to get my money back. So the burden of proof is on me, and that works perfect with what Shmuel just said. Because I want to prove that I'm the, the burden of proof is on me because it happened under my guard. I was the butcher. I shechted it. That's when I found it was a trefa. I have to prove that it was a trefa before. If I can't prove it, my tough luck. But what if I didn't pay the money yet? And then that would be right. That would fit with the words of the Brayta. I want to get my money back. What if I didn't pay money yet? Then it's on the owner of the animal to prove. So, because remember, the Brayta just said, generally, which would mean whoever wants to take the money out. So let's say I buy this animal, but I don't pay for it. Right? I buy on credit. I shecht it. Turns out it was a trefa. So according to Rabbi Baruchesca, what would I have to do? I would have to prove it. According to the bright time, if he wants to get his money, he has to prove it, the owner of the animal. So that's what the Gemara is going to ask. If he didn't pay the money yet, and why? 
according to what Shmuel had said, according to Rambi Bar Yecheskel, Sveka Bereshu Tabachet Yali. The burden of proof is on the one who it happens in his watch. So, what did they answer? Tiyav Tabach Dami. Right? It must be only in the case where he paid the money. To which the Gemara, and if you remember, according to Rabbi Yudah, we said the opposite. It was only in the case where he didn't pay the money. To which we said, my Pascha. But like the, the Brighton didn't specify only in this case, only in that case, right? It doesn't make sense to say that when the Brighton was very general. So my Pascha, like the, what the Gemara is talking about, specific cases without, the Brighton is talking about specific cases without mentioning it. So they say, yeah, well, in fact, Stama de Milta, Normally, when you buy things, what do you do, right? Normally, come to lo yad inish suze, lo yad inish chiyuta, right? If you don't pay the money, then people don't give you the animal. So, a normal, typical case, in which case we could say, the bride is talking about the normal, typical case, where who's the mozi here? The butcher. Because the butcher wants to get his money back because he already paid the money. Normally, he wouldn't get the animal if he hadn't paid the money. So, that's the end of that sugya. So what is this case referring to? The, the rabbis had said, only if, he can only claim this if it was a hidden blemish. Right? That's when he can claim. So now Rav Nachman says, I'm Rav Nachman, if she has epileptic fits, it's like something that's hidden. Now this sounds a little strange, because epileptic fits could happen in public, could happen anywhere. To which the Gemara says, well, when he was talking about it, honey, mele de kviel esman. Only someone who has epileptic fits at particular times of day, always. And then they make sure generally that they're in a closed place and nobody actually sees them. But if they don't have a set time about when they happen, then they're just like regular mumi. Okay? And then, again, he should have seen them before and then he can't claim, oh, I didn't know. Okay? As we said, right, there's always that factor comes into play. If he knew and married her anyway, then it's not claims for this was a mistaken trend, you know, mistaken marriage. Mishnah. Now we get to the other side. What about if he has blemishes? And we're going to see a bit of a different standard. Ha'ish shenoldu bo mumim. En kofino tolotzi. If he, now, according to the wording in the Mishnah, we're going to have all debate what's the exact wording in the Mishnah, but if he develops a blemish, meaning after the marriage, that's not grounds for divorce. We don't force him to divorce her. We're going to get into the whole thing about forcing divorce and how we can do that. That's going to come up later today. Um, a very relevant topic, right, with all sorts of Aguna cases, right, women who can't get gets. Um, how much do we force the husband? We'll talk about this. Amar Rashbag, Bamed Varim. Okay, so the first thing sounds pretty simple, okay? That's not grounds for divorce at all for the woman. However, the first thing is Rashbag limits this and says, well, Smaller blemishes. Which we're going to have to see in the Gemara how these are defined. But if it's a big blemish, then we can force him to divorce her. The Gemara starts off with, not only does Shim and Gamliel redefine the mission a little bit and say it's not so clear cut, it's not grounds for divorce. It could be. This double reading of the Mishnah, one of the readings is also going to open up much more possibilities. Rav Yehuda Tanei Noldu. Okay, Rav Yehuda has the same version that we have in our Mishnah if we're talking about mums that develop later. Chia Barav Tanei Hayu. Chia Barav says if they were, meaning from the beginning. So what's the difference? Wamanda Amar Noldu Koshaken Hayu. If it's a new blemish that appeared and it's not grounds for divorce, then of course, if it was there from the beginning, it's certainly not grounds for divorce because the assumption is she knew about it, married him anyway, and say, said, I don't care. Right? It doesn't bother me. So, of course, she can't claim later, oh, I want to get divorced because of this. Tikasafra of Akibla, because she knew it and accepted it. Manda Amal Hayu, but if you say that the Mishnah says she can't use this as grounds for divorce if he had them from before, well, then you would say, Aval Noldu, lo, but if they develop later, then that would be grounds for divorce because she could say, I only, right, I didn't know about them, I didn't marry him knowing this was going to happen to him. Now that this happened to him, I can't bear to be married to him anymore. Tonight, Amal Rav Nishim Ben Gamliel. So now they're going to say, wait, let's try to use the wording of our mission to try to prove one or the, or the other. So when Rav Nishim Ben Gamliel comes and says, only small blemishes, but if they're large blemishes, then we do force him. Bish Lama Lama Damar Noldu. Hainu Dishane Ben Gedolim Liktanim. 
That only works if you say no do. They develop later. And then you could say, okay, well, if a blemish develops later, it really depends. Is it large or is it small? If it's large and very serious, then that could be grounds for divorce. But, lamanta amal hayu, malik doli malik tanim, if it's some, if it already was there from the beginning and she knew about it and she married him anyway, it shouldn't make a difference, doli mark tanim. Ha safra v'kibla, she accepted it, so it doesn't make a difference. So it doesn't really make sense that the Mishnah is talking about a case where she already knew from before. Kisvurai, so they say, no, you could explain it that way as well. Kisvurai she chola l'kabel, v'achshav en yechola l'kabel, when it comes to a big blemish, so she thought that she could handle it, but it turns out she didn't realize what it was going to be like married to someone with this gigantic blemish, and she could then claim, I didn't realize, and I want to get a divorce now, and we can force him to divorce her. Now we get to Eluhei Mumim Gdolim. What are these Mumim Gdolim? Perush Rashbank, Gigon Nismet Eino Nikta'a Yadon Nishpara Raglo. Like he got blinded in one eye, he lost a hand, he lost a leg. Itma. Rabbi Abba Bar Yaakov, Amar Rabbi Yochanan. So now Rabbi Abba Bar it said, the Rabbi Abba Bar Yaakov said in the name of Rabbi Yochanan, Halacha Ke Rashbag, which is very interesting. Right, he paskins like Rashbag, basically saying, right, the, the Tanakhama had seemed to limit the ability of the woman and Rashbag basically gives her more possibilities of her claiming that she wants to divorce him. So, Rabbi Abba Bar Yaakov now says the halacha is like Rabbi Yochanan. We're going to have a side issue with this, which is kind of an interesting issue, but before we get there, we're going to see that Rava, Amar Rabbi Rav Nachman, halacha kedivrei chachami. So we have two different piskalacha, opposite. Now, they want to ask, Rabbi Abba Bar Yaakov says, Rabbi Yochanan says, the halacha is like Rabbi Yochanan in our mission. Does it really make sense to say that Rabbi Yochanan said this? And the, the reason is not going to be because he doesn't hold like Rashbag. The reason is going to be because it's obvious he holds like Rashbag. You didn't even need to tell us this. Because there's a general principle Rabbi Yochanan said elsewhere. This was passed down by Rabbi Barbachan in the name of Rabbi Yochanan. Anytime you see Rabbi Shimon Gamliel in our Mishnah, disagreeing with Tanakama, we always hold like him, chutz mi erev tzaydan, uh, sorry, arev tzaydan uraya achona, other than three cases. Okay, what are these three cases? These are three cases we don't hold like Rashbag. One is, if you're a guarantor for a loan, the, the creditor can't go directly to the guarantor unless the borrower has no money. If the borrower has any kind of money, he has to demand it from the borrower, not from the guarantor. Apparently, we don't hold like him. Um, Saidan is, if, a, if it was actually, Saidan is a place, it's in Lebanon, um, it's, it's, a play, it's, a, it's a story that happened, it's a Mishnah in Gitin, I, I think it's Ayin Dalit, about if he, he gives her a get upon condition, right? like we've learned that, all these stipulations, and there was a case that happened in, in Saidan where he said, um, um, here's your get, on the condition that you return to me my cloak, and then the cloak got lost. So now she can't fulfill the condition. So the rabbis had said in that case, according to Rashbag, that she returns the value of the cloak. So there we don't hold like Rashbag either. And you know, that will be the fulfillment of the tonight. Raya Chorna is an interesting case. A guy comes to court and says, they say, bring witnesses. He says, I don't have witnesses. Bring a proof. I don't have a proof. And then he comes back later and has witnesses or has a proof. So Tanakama says, we don't believe him, right? If he had had witnesses, he would have said, I have witnesses. You know, all of a sudden he has witnesses. He must have gone and hired people to be witnesses. Comes Rashbag and he says, what do you mean? Like, poor guy. What if he didn't have witnesses? And then it turns out he finds out later that there's witnesses. What, you're not going to let them testify on his behalf? So he goes to say, you can, right, the, what they call it, Rayach Rona, because there's three machlokot about these kind of cases in the Mishnah between Tanakam and Rashbag. And this was the last case. And we don't have like Rashbag in the last case. So the main question is, why did Rabbi Abba say that Rabbi Yochanan said the halacha is like Rashbag? If we know he always holds like Rashbag, other than three cases, and this is not one of the three cases, to which they answer, Amorayin in Uvali with Rabbi Yochanan. There's machloka between Amorayin, what Rabbi Yochanan held, whether he always holds like Rashbag or not necessarily, and because of that, Rabbi Abba Rayakov obviously didn't hold like Rabbi Barachana. Rabbi Barachana said that Rabbi Yochanan said this, but Rabbi Abba didn't think that, so he wanted to specify every time we hold like Rashbak. Mishnah. Now, after we said that if he has a moom, right, we can't force him to divorce her, 
except if it's a mum gadol, according to Rashbag, but now we say, but there are a bunch where we do force. What are these cases? Mukachrin, if he has boils on his body. Ubal polypus, which sounds like polyps. We'll talk about that later. Mikamets, which we don't yet know what it is. Mitzaref nechoshet, he's a copper welder. Haborsi, he works as a tanner. Okay, these were jobs that basically caused bad odors in people. Okay, they smell really bad, and therefore she can't live with the bad smell. Ben Shayu, okay, except for the Mukachrin and the Baal Polypus, but the other ones are smell related. Even the Baal Polypus we're going to see is also smell related. Ben Shayu ad shalom nisu, u ben mishen nisu no do. It doesn't matter whether they were there from the beginning and she said, I can marry him anyway. She didn't realize how bad it was. Or whether she married him and, right, and then it happened. Al kula mama rabi meir, af apishit naima, even if he made a condition with her about it, Yecholai she tomar, she could say, Sfura yiti shani yechola l'kabel, v'achshav eni yechola l'kabel. She could say, listen, I thought I could handle this, but I really can't. Chachamim omrim, mekabeleti al korcha. All of them, if she accepted it, tough luck on her. You can't use this as grounds for divorce. Chutzmi, now obviously if he wants to divorce her, he can, but the point is, you can't force him to divorce her. Chutzmi mukachchin, mepnei shemimikato. The Mukhachin is a whole separate issue from all the rest of them. It has nothing to do with her being disgusted by it, or at least not only, but having relate with the problem is like this. When they have relations, it causes his skin to shed and it like destroys his body, which means that they basically can't have relations. Now again, that's a basic part of marriage. So if they can't have relations, then she can demand divorce. So that's the only case that's different than the others, according to the rabbis, right? He distinguishes and says, that's the only case that's grounds for divorce. The others are not, if she accepted it. Ma'asebet Sidon, b'borsi echad shemei. There was a case, though, in Sidon, where there was a borsi, this is the same place we were talking about before, where there was a tanner who died. And his brother was a tanner, okay? Family business. Anyway, she falls to Yibam to the brother. Vayalo ach borsi, so his brother was also. Amru chachamim, yecholai shetomar l'achicha, yiti yechola l'kabel, ulachai ni yechola l'kabel. She could come, listen, I can't do Yibam with you because you're a Borsi. He could say, what do you mean? My brother was also. She said, yeah, but I loved your brother and I was willing to get over it because I loved him. But you, I don't have those same feelings, so I'm not willing to marry you because you have this terrible smell. right? Which shows the whole, right? and obviously I didn't state this, but it's obvious because we talked about this already, of the women, again, wanted to be married. And therefore, they were willing to stay married even though there were these mumim and the that affects Allah, since the women in general were more okay to kind of stay married. Therefore, probably that affected the rabbis push to say, oh, we don't force them to give a gift because most women are okay with this, right? Unless they stayed otherwise, and then, you know, and then it depends on the situation, whether we're, and it depends on what your opinion is about whether we'll agree or not, whether we allow you to, to claim, make a claim or not, right? We see all sorts of different opinions about this. Not so clear cut. Now the Gemara wants to know, what are all these things mentioned in the Mishnah? My Baal Polypus, Amarav Yud, Amar Shmuel, Reach HaChotem. It's a bad smell, a foul odor in the nose, the nostrils, but Manita Tan and Abraita, they say Reach HaPeh. It's a bad, um, bad breath. Rav Asi Mani Ibcha. He said it's flipped. It's the Braita that says foul odor in the nostrils, and it's Shmuel who said bad breath. V, right? So it's not a huge difference, but it's just who said what? Shmuel doesn't stop talking about this entire parak. So what does that mean? Talking, mouth, that's how you connect Shmuel with the mouth. And therefore he must have said Reachapeh, that was how he remembered his version. That's someone who gathers the all the dung, okay, of the of the um, dogs. Okay, you could use some of that in my neighborhood. Um okay. Now, yeah, you can see why that would be a job that would make you smell bad. Metive, wait a minute. There's a bright that contradicts this. It says, Mikametze Borsi, that's a tanner. So, which the Gemara says, well, if you want it right now, again, Rav Yehuda said it's someone who collects the dung of the dogs. The Brighta says it's a Borsi, that seems to go against. But he says, as a response, Felita Mech, according to you, you think it's a Borsi. Well, Tikshelach Matnitin, right? You're trying to prove for the Brighta it's a Borsi, but then the Mishnah makes no sense because the Mishnah listed So you can't possibly say that bor- that Mekamets is Borsi, then Borsi is mentioned twice. It makes no sense. So the bright is not so difficult, right? The, sorry, the Mishnah. 
Kam beborsi gadol, kam beborsi katan. Whether you're a tanner of, I assume it means large animals or small animals. Um, right, hai dechashiv? Yeah, I don't know. Shuhu ani v'yesh lo orot ma'at. Ah, I see. Rashi says borsi katan is a poor, right? He is a poor borsi, so he doesn't have a lot, right? He has a small business. So if his business is small, it's not so, right? Uh, it's not such a big, it's not going to smell so bad. But Rav Yehuda, how are you going to explain it? If the Brita says Borsi, then it's Borsi. Tanaihi, Titani, Makamit, Ze Borsi, Yeshomrim, Zan, Makamit, Soat, Klavi. He says, No, I'll show you another Brita says there's a machloket about it. I just don't hold by that Brita. Okay? I hold by the other opinion. Hamitzaref, Nechoshev, Ah, Borsi. My Mitzaref, Nechoshev. What does this mean? Rav Ashiamal, Chashli, Dude. He's someone who makes kettles. So he, he, he pounds the copper to make the the kettles and that causes a bad smell. Rabbi Barbarchana Marzam Khatech Nechoshami Karov, he mines copper. That's what causes it to be you know, have a foul smell. Tanya Kavate de Rabba Barbarchana will bring a bright to support his opinion, Ezumitsarev Zam Khatech Nechoshami Karov, and that supports his opinion. Amarav. Now we move into other issues with husbands and means you know reasons for divorce. Amarav. You have a husband who says, forget about that, he has some physical blemish on his body. This is more emotional abuse. He says to, or maybe you could call this physical abuse, not physical as in physically abusing, but but taking away some physical need of hers, which is, I'm not going to support you at all. Not giving you food, not sustenance. He has to divorce her and give her her ketubah money. Okay, because he's abusing her basically, and he's not giving her the privileges of marriage. Azal Rabbi Elazar, Amar the Shmate Kamei de Shmur. So Rabbi Elazar went. Okay, Rabbi Elazar is an Emora in Eretz Israel, but he started his, in the beginning of his career with learning with Rabbi Shmur. Then he moved to Israel and became Rabbi Yochanan's Tamim Mufak, right, his main student. Anyway, he goes and says this before Shmuel. This is important for the story because first he learns it with Rab, then he goes to say what Rab said to Shmuel. Amar. Shmuel's response is, Aksua sare le'elazar. Feed animal f- food, which is barley. Feed bar- barley to elazar. At shekofino to lotzi yechafu lezun. It's interesting, is punishing him with food. Right? I mean, he's relating to this food issue, this person who won't give food to his wife. He says, what are you crazy? We're going to force him to give a get? No, we're going to force him to feed her. In other words, force him to do his basic need. Now you might say, okay, there's two ways to look at this. One is, he's hesitant to force divorce, which we see in the courts nowadays. They're very hesitant to issue what we call a chiyuv get that we've talked about a number of times, which is, they say to the husband, you have to give her again, and then they can start instituting sanctions on him. So, one is, maybe he's just hesitant to do that and says, let's rectify the problem before we do that. The other might be actually to protect the woman, because the woman might prefer to stay married. Again, you know, it's the question. And it's a question, maybe it's different in those days, but... Maybe she'd prefer that you resolve the issue and she stay married than be a divorcee on the street trying to find another husband. So it could be he's trying to protect the woman in this. It's a good question, right? Whether you're quick to divorce or say, you know, maybe try to resolve it. So two ways to look at what he says, but he's very strong about this. You can see by his language, the way he talks to Elazar, you're deserving to eat barley for saying such a ridiculous thing. And really, you should just force him to feed her. The Rav, so why wouldn't Rav say that? This is what you or I would be prone to say probably, which is, okay, so let's imagine the scenario. The guy's a, a real, you know, not not a great guy or pretty bad guy that he won't feed his wife. So she'll bring him to court. They'll force him to give her food. You know, a year later, he'll do the same thing. Or a month later, he'll do the same thing. Right? A woman doesn't want to live with the kind of person who would do this. It's obviously indicative of what kind of person he is. And it's unfair to make her live with a snake, basically, that, you know, he could do this at any time. You wouldn't live with a snake in a glove, right? That's or in a small space. Kiselik Rabbi Zera. The story continues. When Rabbi Zera goes up to Israel. Okay, this is why I told you the story is interesting in terms of first Rabbi Lazar learned in, in Babylonia, and then he moves to Israel. Also, Rabbi Zera goes to Israel. Eshkachul Rabbi Binyamin Bar Yefet, the Yativik Amalan Mishmed Rabbi Yochanan. He heard him quoting in the name of Rabbi Yochanan the exact same halacha as Rav. To which Rabbi Zera says to him, Amalei, Al Da Iksu Asalan Al Lazar Bebevel. On this issue, they fed. Barley, even though they didn't really literally feed him, but they fed barley to Elazar on this issue, and he said, I don't know what you're talking about. You know, we don't do this. 
Okay, so there's this big debate here, and you can see how strong they were about their opinions, about whether you force the husband to give a get or you don't force. Amar Rav Yehuda, Amar Rav Asi. Ein ma'asin el el psulat. Ma'asin is what we call a get me'useh, ma'ayin and a sin. It means to force, okay? It's when we force a husband to give a get. And force to the extent, right? How can we force? We'll talk about it soon. Can you use physical, beat him up, or not? So we only force gets for psulo. That means, okay, we're going to see right now. When I said this in front of Shmuel, Rabbi Yehuda said, he said, If you're a widow married to a kohen gadol, only for forbidden marriages, not for issues like we're talking about. Mamzeret and Tinali Israel, if somebody married a Mamzeret, by Israel and Netinu the Mamzer, if she was about Israel, but she married a Mamzer or a Netin, Aval Nasa Isha. Okay, so now those are cases you can force again, but this case you can't. For example, Nasa Isha, Vishahaima Eser Shlinim Velo Yada, if they couldn't have children for 10 years, and Kofinoto. We don't force them to give a divorce. However, of Tachlifa Baravimi Amar Shmuel, he says in the name of Shmuel differently. Okay, there's a debate what Shmuel held about this. Even in that case, we force divorce. Okay, now here's a very, it's a very complicated issue this whole 10 years because it's not clear whether the problem lies with him or the problem lies with her, right? The obvious problem is he can't fulfill his mitzvah of pru revu. Some will say he can take another wife, right? So you don't need to divorce, even though they were pretty much discouraging of taking another wife. Obviously, nowadays you can't do that. Um, it's not necessarily that you'll find someone to marry. It's not necessarily you'll marry someone who will be able to give you children, right? Maybe the problems with him. It's not necessarily, you know, you might not get have a, a boy and a girl, right? Some people don't ever have, end up with a boy and a girl and fulfilling their mitzvah anyway. So it's a bit of a strange, complicated topic, this whole thing, and obviously very emotionally complicated, you know, not even, you know, with the, important to address that as well. Tanan. So this is machloket about whether Shmuel thinks you can force divorce in that case or not. So now they say, let's try to figure out who's right. Tonight, look at our Mishnah. Our Mishnah says, these are the people we forced to divorce their wives. Mukachim, Baal Polipus, etc. Bishlam al Rav Asi. Now, Rav Asi makes sense. Why? Because what did Rav Asi say? We can force for cases of Psul Chitun, right? Where they can't get married by Jewish law. So, all those things don't appear in our Mishnah. Why? Because those are all Torah law, and this is rabbinical. And then, the case of not having children isn't here, even though that's also rabbinic. There's certainly no Torah requirement. It's rabbinic. But that's not here because you actually don't force divorce. And that makes perfect sense. But, According to Rav Tachli Baravimi, since that's Durabanan and our Mishnah is Durabanan, it should have mentioned all the cases that are rabbinic. should have listed that in our Mishnah. Now, you could say... That wasn't really our topic. Our topic is mumim. And this, you know, whether this is a mum or not, maybe would. I don't know. It's a good question. Anyway, Amar of Nachman lo kashia haba mile haba There's an interesting answer. It's even more interesting the response to this answer. But the reason it's not mentioned is if you can't have children for 10 years. So the rabbis talk to you about saying, maybe you should divorce her. But they don't force it. They only force it with words. They don't force it with whips and, you know, beating you. Whereas the other cases, if the husband won't give the get, we beat him. Here's where you see that you can beat the husband if he doesn't do this. Mats get right if he's supposed to give a get. Although, basically, that gets neutralized somewhat or, or, you know, kind of, in halacha, they basically minimize this. And they really do not allow beatings, only in extreme cases. They don't really allow it for normal cases. Um, it's a whole big issue nowadays. Like, when they put sanctions on the husband, what kind of sanctions they can put on this a very... There's a case right now of a Mr. Revit get where they they tried to not let him bury his father and then he basically committed, okay, I'll I'll give the get if you let me bury my father. They buried the father and then um, he didn't give the get. And if you're familiar with the case. And now his mother's very ill and they're trying to basically use it again, because he basically duped them, trying to use it again and say, you know, we're not gonna let you bury the mother. It actually comes up in the Shulchan Aruch about not burying we we can sanction them by not letting them bury their children. Um, so, Rav Usher Weiss, nowadays, he basically said we can apply this in this case to not burying the parents as well. But that's a sanction we can put on him in order, but then he limits it to only if the parents were supportive of him not giving the divorce. If the parents were against him 
and tried to get him to give the divorce, then you can't penalize the parents. It's a crazy situation to say, we're not going to bury your parents, right? On the other hand, it's a good tool to use up against him. It's all a question of what sanctions we can use. It's a very interesting sugi here. So Matzkafla Rabbi Abba, Rabbi Abba says, wait a minute. You want to say that we're going to try to force him with words. But we all know, it's a Pasuk of Mishle, right? No one's going to be whipped into shape by words. That just doesn't work. So that's a useless that's a useless mechanism. Ella am Rabbi Abba. So Rabbi Abba says, okay, fine. Hava Habba Shote. Both cases you can use physical force. Hatam ki amra havina bahade shafkinala. Ha ha afa gav da amrina havina bahade lo shafkidala. Okay, if she says, um, one second, havina, I just forgot what this is for a second. Havina bahade. Right. If she says, right, now I remember. If she says, I'm going to stay with him, then we let her. That's for all the other cases, like the mukachin and all that. But hacha, afagav, but when it comes to the case of 10 years where they haven't had children, since he wants to, right, since basically they're not having children, lo shavkinala. She can't say, I'm willing to stay married to him anyway. That's, a, that, that's the distinction between the cases, and that's why it's not mentioned in our Mishnah. To which they say, wait a minute, though. That doesn't make sense. Remember we said in the Mishnah, she can't, about a Mukachchin, say, I don't care, I'll stay married to him. Why? Because it destroys his body by having relations, and then she'll be in a, but she can't stay married to him when it's forbidden for her to have relations with him. Vikatane, right? And yet it's listed. So that's not a good distinction. So they say, no, 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 it is. Because there's still a distinction. There is a case where she could stay married to this Mukachchin without having relations to, with him when she says the following. I'm going to live with him. I want to stay married to him. I'm going to live with him, but we're not going to have relations. And how can I prove it? I'm going to live with witnesses in our house that will testify that we don't sleep together. Then Shavkinala. Then she can actually stay married to him. Like she's basically willing to give up on her own. She doesn't care. But when it comes to the case of the ten years, even though she says, I'm going to live with him with witnesses, because again, that's not the issue here. Okay. Now we're going to get into something that's going to take us to the end of the daf, which is the end of the chapter, and we're going to get into two very interesting stories. Okay, there was an elderly man from Anshe Yerushalayim who told me that there's 24 types of mukachin which are boils, all of them, they can't have relations. Right? It, it destroys their body. Okay, this thing called which could possibly be leprosy, is the worst of them all. What causes this? Okay, this is classic. The Gemara wants to know what causes these things. If you do bloodletting, which was something they did for health reasons, and you have relations right after, you'll have weaker children. If the husband and wife both bloodlet and then have relations, that's what causes these children to be ba'alei ra'atan. Papa lo amaran midi says, but this is only if you don't eat anything after doing the bloodletting before having relations. Aval time midi but if you eat something. The whole point was that the bloodletting was healthy for your body, but in the very short term, it weakens you and having relations would be even worse. And therefore, they discourage people from doing it by saying, you'll have these children who balei ratan. But then, of course, they quote this as saying, that's how the balei ratan are created by parents who did the following, even though not necessarily. My money. how do you know? What's, the, what's, what's a, a mark of a person who's balei ratan? How do you know? Dolphin ANA, their eyes are dripping with, you know, they're always, everything's, um, dripping, basically. We're going to have their eyes, their nostrils, there's, there's uh, saliva coming out of their mouth, and there's a lot of, they end up with a lot of bees surrounding them. Maya sute, what's their cure? And now, going to get a really strange description of how to cure. We always know these cures are kind of strange. In the end, it's going to come down to that they, they assume one of the zvuvim got into the brain, and you have to basically go in and, and do surgery, brain surgery. So you're basically going to get a description of how they did brain surgery in their days. It's kind of crazy to think about. Okay, Amar Abai. Pila Veludana, which are types of grass. You take Girda de Agosa, the, the scrapings of the walnuts. Girda de Ashpa, the scrapings of, the, of a smooth hide of an animal. Kleo Malka, 
which they say is uh, Artemisia, and Metachla de Dikla Sumaka. You take the the I have to remember it's something from a from a date. Okay, I see Ruth, you're telling me it's a lily. So yeah, in general, I I find the Koran has the best translations for all these things that are that are uh, that are actual things. Okay, Artemisia is. They say here it's, it grows on, in plains and sandy areas and bears small flowers. And essential oil has been used as medicine from here from ancient times. There's all these descriptions of what exactly these are. Um, so if you're interested in botany and all that, this is a, they have really good footnotes in the Koran. I'm not going to spend our time in it because we have some really interesting stories coming up. Um, anyway, we have, um, so you take this Cleo Malka, you take the calyx of a red date palm, okay, and then you cook them all together. We're going to read that. Shalik lei bahad yadadi. Cook them together. Ma'ayala lebeta deshisha. You bring them into a house made of marble, which basically means there's no wind there. We've talked about this a bunch of times. It comes up. You want a place without wind. Bilo ika beta deshisha. If you don't have that, ma'ayala lebeta deshev levani v'arichai. Has seven layers of stones, of bricks. V'nati lei tlat me'akase al reisha. You pour 300 cups of this substance on his head. Until it's very soft on the top of his head. You can then open it up. You take four myrtle branches. You basically take every leg of the, of the bee and put it on a myrtle branch. And then you pick it out with a tweezer. And then you roast it to eat, like you burn it. Singe it. Because if not, it'll go right back in. Okay, interesting description. Tov, Mahriz Rabbi Yochanan. Now this is going to sound very much like um, like COVID, okay? He's the Harum is Vuve Shelbale Ratan. Stay far away from this Vuvim because they have with it the, the disease on it and they can transmit the disease. Rabbi Zerolo Abayat Bizike, he wouldn't stand anywhere where there was the wind, where like a wind was blowing from one of these people that were Bale Ratan, right? This is how much, right? They, they wore masks, right? They didn't say mask, but basically stay far away from the wind coming from where this Balei Ratan were. Rabbi Lazar lo ayal ba'ole, he wouldn't go into a tent. Rabbi Ami, Rabbi Asi, lo ba'achli mi bei da'um ba'ole, they wouldn't eat an egg that came out of an alleyway, where in that alleyway somewhere was someone who had this disease. However, and here comes the big lead into our story. There was one person who didn't care. Rabbi Yoshua ben Levi, mi karech behu, which means literally he, he stuck to them, as opposed to write like, in Hebrew the word is davak, which is the same word used for it's midabek. It's contagious. Okay? He stuck with these people. Va'asik b'Torah. And he would teach them Torah. Right? If everyone stays away from them, these poor people will have no way to learn. He was willing to risk his life. Amal, he said the following. Ayelet ahavim v'yalat chen, which is a description of, the, 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 it's understood to be uh, an allegory for the Torah. Im chen ma'ala alomdeha, agune lomagna. If it's going to bring grace to its learners, should it not protect them as well? So therefore, I'm protected by learning, by teaching Torah. So what was his reward? When he died, God said, do whatever he wants. It was his time to die. God says, go see what he wants, how he wants to die. So Malach HaMavet appears to him. By the way, there's a, Shuli wrote all about Rabbi Shobin Levi and what other things about him um, in this week's flashback, so worthwhile reading. Anyway, Amalei Achvelei Duchtai. So Shobin Levi says to him, I want to see the place where I'm going to be in Gan Eden. Amalei Lechai, he said, great, no problem. Amalei, have li sakinech. But give me your knife, he asked. Malach HaMavet, dilma mevaet lei ba'orcha, I'm scared to walk with you. You might kill me on the way. You know, give me your knife. Yave Nile, he says, okay, I'll give you my knife. Kimata lahata, and when he got there, Dalye, he lifts him up, kamach velei, right? He like picks him up so he could see into heaven. He says, that's your spot right there. Shval, Yeshua ben Levi jumps, nafalahu gisi, falls on the other side of Gan Eden, nachti b'karni deglime, the Malach HaMavet tries to pull him up, amalei b'shvuata deloatina. He says, I swear I'm not coming. I'm here. Okay, basically what happens is he dies without dying, right? He gets to heaven without having gone through death. Okay, like Eliyahu and Avi, right? Like Eliyahu in uh, Melachim, right? Goes up to the heavens. He doesn't even really die. He's basically averted death. And he's straight in heaven already. So 
question is, is this swear a good swear? Now, this is interesting because we're in the chapter of nidarim, swears, right? And if the woman takes on a neder and doesn't keep it, does keep it, right? All this stuff. So what does God say? If any time in his life he undid a, a swear or didn't keep to what he swore, then he's going back. But if not, he's not going back. And in fact, he had never taken any swears in his life that he didn't keep or that he tried to undo. And therefore, he gets to stay. So now comes Malacham Av. And I'm really Havli Sakinai. Give me my knife back. He wouldn't give it to him. So Batko comes down from the heavens. Give it to him because he needs it. Like that's his job. He can't do his job without. He needs it. So he needed to anyway. Anyway. That's what happens. Okay? We're going to compare. I'll, I'll wait for the analysis till we get to the second story. Um, anyway, next. Machriz Eliyahu Kameh. So Eliyahu now announces, Panu Makom Lebar Levi, Panu Makom Lebar Levi. Make way, this great man has come in to Ben Levi. Because his name is Yoshua Ben Levi. Azal Eshkachel Rabbi Yishimam Bar Yochai, Dehaviyativ Al Tlat Asar Tachtiz Ted Fiza. Pisa. He sees Rabbi Shem Rabbi who's on 13 golden stools, right? This is, you know, these magnificent stories they talk about in heaven. 13 golden stools. Amr le atu bar He says, are you the one they're talking about? Amr le He says, yes. Nira ta keshef yamecha. Did you ever see a, a rainbow? Amr le He said, yes. Imken yata bar If not, you must not be bar If you saw a rainbow, because a rainbow is a sign that God wanted to destroy the Jewish people, and he stopped himself because of the promise, but it's a sign that things were bad, and if you were this great person, you would have protected all the people. Velohi happens, it wasn't true. Rabbi Shoah Ben Levi lied. He really never saw a rainbow, and obviously it really was, he was Ben Levi. Tilo Avimidi, okay, it, it really never happened. El Asavar, but what, why did he lie? Loach Zitivut Alanafshi, he was uncomfortable with, he, he wanted him not to really think he was Ben Levi, he couldn't. Right, it's interesting. Why do you say you're Ben Levi, Levi? And he said, "Yes, I am." But then he realizes maybe he didn't realize what that meant. Maybe he didn't hear Eliyahu making this big announcement of him coming. Once he realized that Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai was trying to test him, Are you this great man, he said, "I'll be modest about it and I'll lie." Okay. Next, um, next story, and this is the foil story. Okay, Yona Frankel has an excellent comparison of the two stories and what the what the moral is. Okay, so let's listen to the next story and start thinking about. The comparison of the two stories. Rabbi Chanina Bar Papa Shush He was a friend, a buddy of the Malach Hamavet, which maybe already gives you an indication that he's not the greatest person, okay? Because who, who hangs out with the Malach Hamavet, right? Ki Abba Kanaich Nafshe, Amulei the Malach Hamavet, Zil Avelei Reuta. Okay, again, they say the Malach Hamavet, do whatever he wants. So he obviously was a pretty good guy. Azel Gabebi, Tchazelei, same thing happens. Malach Hamavet goes to him, appears to him, Amulei, Shivki Talton Yom and Adin Eharder Tamudai. I want to review my Torah for 30 days. Give me 30 days more, please. The Amre, why? Because they say, Better is the person who comes here when he's got all of his learning under, right, under his belt, knows everything. Shavke, so he leaves him alone for 30 days. He goes and appears to him after 30 days. Amre, he says, go show me the spot in Gan Eden where I'm going to be. Amrle Lachai says, sure, no problem. Amrle, Havli Sakinech, same story. Give me your knife. Dilma Vait Liba Orcha. Amrle, Kechaberech Ba Lemea Vedli. What, you want to do what your friend did to me? This is like the Torah stories where they each make mention of the other. What, you want to do what Rabbi Shobin Levi did? No way, no how. Amrle, I did Sefer Torah Vachase. Go take out a Sefer Torah and show me. Me, Ikamidi, Diktibe, Deloki, Amte. Is there anything in the Torah that I didn't do? So I'm deserving of that too. Did you sit and learn Torah with the Baalei Ra'atan? That's what got Yosho Levi in there. But you didn't. You learned Torah, maybe you kept all the mitzvot, but you weren't teaching Torah to these people who no one would teach. Even so, he didn't get what he wanted, but there was a pillar of fire between him and everybody else. Ugamiri, and we know that there's only one or two in a generation where that would happen to. We've seen this story before of a pillar of fire being there for some great rabbi. Not so long ago we saw this. Anyway, Krav the Gabe Rabbi Alexandri. It was, by the way, in those stories of the Torah learners who left their houses. Krav the Gabe Rabbi Alexandri. Now, what's the problem? The problem is no one could bury him because of this pillar of fire. So they had a problem. It was a good thing, but it was a bad thing. So Alexandra goes to the, him and says, and then they're talking to the dead body, they say, Do it for the respect of the rabbis. You're a rabbi, you know, let us bury you. Lo eshkach, he didn't listen. 
do it for your father's respect. Lo he didn't listen. do for your own kavod. Istalik. The amud, the pillar of fire disappears. Amrabai la fuke miman de lo kiyem. Okay, in other words, this amud was to separate between the people who kept the Torah and the people who didn't keep the Torah. Amale Rav Adav Ramatna la fuke mimar de lo eat le ma'akali yigarei. No, it was to separate between the people who didn't put up a ma'ake, a, 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 what do you call it, a, a fence on their roofs so the people won't fall off the roof. And he was trying to say to Abaye, because you don't have a fence on your roof, okay? Vilohi, but it's not really true. Again, another, it wasn't really true. Mihave havya, he actually had put up a fence on his roof, but the wind came and blew it away at that moment, and therefore it looked like he didn't have a fence on his roof. Okay, this seems totally not connected, but we'll talk about it in a minute. Anyway, last thing before I, I kind of add, so that way if you don't want to listen to my analysis, you can stop here. I know I'm going a little over. Okay, why don't we have these kind of people anymore? It's because they eat beets and they drink this his me beer. Amar Rabbi Yochanan, mipnei ma'im b'tzorayim b'bavel, mipnei shochlin t'chadim v'shotin shecha v'ruchatzim b'mei prati, as if they also bathe in the Euphrates and that cures them from this, having this disease or prevents them from having it with that. Hadron alacham adir tishto. Okay, what's with these two stories now? So, the contrast, and Yonah Frankel says this very beautifully in, in his book, um, Sipur Agadach, Duchel Tochen B'tzura. He basically says, and, and you know, it's, it's, his stuff is great because once you see it, it's so obvious in the story. Rabbi Shoven Levi, his greatness is that he does for other people, as opposed to Rabbi Hanina by Papa, where all his learning is all for his own self, kavod, right? He wants, he says, I did all the Torah, right? But he didn't teach others. He wants, right, in the end, the pillar of fire, the only thing he's convinced by is do it for your own respect. That seems to be the only thing that interests him, whereas Rabbi Shoven Levi is the opposite. He's not looking for respect at all. He lies out of try to not get respect. And what's interesting about him lying, why does the test did he keep his shvuot? Because he's tricking all along this story. He tricks the Malach HaMavet. He lies to Rabbi Shem But those are all for good reasons. But in the end, he's a super honest person, and that's the test. In the end, it's his honesty that keeps him. But even though like, there's honesty here, there's humility, the real main thing, focus on him, is that he does for others. What's the proof? He takes the knife, and he... Why did he take the knife? Not because he was scared. He wanted to take the knife, ultimately, to not let the Malach HaMavet get to people and if you think about it, he was a healer he was trying you know he was trying to heal them through learning torah so he right his whole thing was trying to heal these other people and had it in the end he tries to you know he sees the malacham Abed as the enemy because he's the one kind of getting to these people who are sick so he's trying to kind of heal people by taking away the powers of the malacham Abed. so his lying and tricking is only to to do for others and that's what makes him such a great person Whereas Hanina Bar Papa is using his Torah, it's, it's kind of going back to all those Torah stories of the rabbis who left their houses for so many years, right? It's, it's how you learn Torah. It's not, Torah itself is, is, could be dangerous. You could use it for the wrong purposes. And then, if you want to connect it to this chapter, and it's all about husband and wife and making vows and commitments and all that. And I think that it's interesting that, you know, Rabbi Shoban Levi did something that people weren't willing to do, you know, but he saw a value in it and that, you know, yes, you can try to divorce, and yes, you can, you know, and, and what grounds do you have for divorce and all that, but, you know, maybe there's something to making the peace and, and trying to work things out and trying to live together, even, you know, make connections that maybe are, are complicated, but make them work. Maybe there's something to be said for that, for keeping your word, right, for not all about yourself, right, that's what they all say about relationships, right, do for others, um, create better communication. Anyway, um, interesting story. There's a lot more to be said for it, but that's it for today. Have a great day, everyone. We will start Chapter 8 tomorrow.